Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. All right. So here we are. The game's Odyssey podcast unscripted. This is this is going to be a new experience for us, right? Yes, it is. I'm looking <laughs> forward to this. It should be fun. Yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, we're going to just kind of chat through the 2022 games, both the Olympics and the Paralympics, because they just happened. But I think while things are fresh in our mind, it'll be fun to just kind of talk about what stood out to us about the games, what the highlights were, even though we don't really talk about current events much on the show since we're history based. I think it'll be worth documenting this for history's sake and for, you know, acknowledging what stood out to us right now that maybe people will be talking about years from now. I don't know. I just thought it'd be kind of a fun idea to see what we both got out of the games. And I think it'll I think it'll be really interesting when we go through all the Olympics and Paralympics that we're going to. And mm-hmm. even though that it will be very far down the road to compare, you know, at that moment when we record and and kind of take a step back and we've had some time removed to compare our thoughts then compared to our thoughts now. And I it goes without saying that it hopefully by then we have a final decision made on what color of team metal figure skaters are getting <laughs> um, from the team event yeah. and just everything that has gone on with that situation. So um, it'll yeah. be really interesting to see what what comes out over the next months, maybe even years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Also, another kind of new experience for me, I just realized um, I have my dog in here with me and I normally don't record with him in here. He's pretty docile at night. Honestly, he's pretty docile most of the time because he's old. He's he's 10 years old and just kind of likes to hang out these days. But hopefully he'll be nice and quiet for us. Uh, I think he just wants to hear what we got out of (laughs) out of the games, too. Has Theo ever been in the room while we've been recording for you? You know, he hasn't. And I had no idea Mm -hmm. that Sirius was in there with you. Um, Does he have a collar that makes noise? Because Theo has his little jingle on his collar. So you would know if he was in here unless he was sleeping, you know, like when he's sleeping, you never know. Yeah, Sirius has a collar that he almost never wears. Uh, So it stays in the garage most of the time because he's he's pretty much an indoor dog these days. We do send him outside every now and then when it's nice weather and he can kind of walk around and <laughs> do his thing. But most of the time he's inside with us. So it, it's easy for us to look at each other and say, where in the world is Sirius? And then, you know, <laughs> he's just being quiet, just sleeping somewhere in the house. And then we track him down. But anyway, so this is a new experience. We'll see. Uh, hopefully he'll he'll be quiet and just listen to the conversation. So let's let's talk about Beijing 2022. And since they happened first, we're going to talk about the Olympics first and what stood out to us. And I think, I think it's important to just kind of note here before we get into these things that these aren't necessarily all um, positive things. Uh, We definitely try to stay positive on the show, but we also don't shy away from some of the harder things. And we've said that before. We'll say it again. So these aren't necessarily our top 10 favorite things that happened during the games. It's the it's the top things that stood out to us that we think are worth remembering and worth talking about. So we'll kind of get that out there first and foremost. And then the second thing is we're not going to do this in a specific order. Again, it's not a top 10 countdown. It's just we're going to talk about them in the order that we talk about them. <laughs> so tell me what's however you want to handle your list tell me what's first on your mind and and then we'll just go back and forth until we cover everything all right so the first thing that i wrote down coming into this episode i have always been a huge fan of ivana myers taylor and Mm -hmm. it's also fresh in our minds because mono bob and the two women bob sled those events happened towards the end of the olympic games um watching everything that she went through. Um, She gets to China. She's diagnosed with COVID, has to go into Mm -hmm. isolation, doesn't know if she's going to get to compete at all. Um, She has her family with her, her husband. She has a son who is just a little bit younger than my son. Um, He's 
I believe just turned two years old and he also has Down syndrome. And Alana has just been such a wonderful advocate for her son, um, just the things that she does for him as any mother would. And I know that that, that in and yeah. of itself is not unique, but the way that she has figured out how to travel the world on the bobsled circuit, make, like be able to put his needs first. And then um, because she was with COVID, she was sick, um, she couldn't be on an opening ceremony, but Team USA elected her as the flag bearer. And since she couldn't participate, and she actually auctioned off the jacket that was part mm-hmm. of her Team USA kit to benefit the Down Syndrome Association. And just little things like that that she does to not just be a great athlete, to be a great mom, but also to help others outside of her circle. Um, Something else that I found very interesting is that when she was competing, anyone that I was following on Twitter, whether it's Team USA staff, NBC Olympic staff, USA Today journalist, um, just all these journalists, everybody, they were making comments and sharing stories about, oh, this one time I met Alana at a Coca-Cola event, and here's what she did for me that was really kind. Um, I had the privilege Mm -hmm. to meet Alana a few years ago in New York, and she was kind. She was wonderful. We got to chat for a little bit. Um, And so I just, everything about her has been incredible. But what happened is that she got out of COVID isolation. She was able to compete. She made it to the starting line for Monobob, the first ever Monobob event for the women. And in the Olympics, and she comes away with the silver medal. And then a few days later, yeah. she comes away in two women bobsled with a bronze medal. That makes her a five-time Olympic medalist. She is now the most decorated Black athlete um, in Winter Olympic history, um, and which I think is just incredible. That's not most decorated female overall athlete. She surpassed um, Shawnee Davis, the speed skater. She is also now the mm-hmm. most decorated bobsledder of all time in Olympic history. And it, oh, it I goes back that to, one. Yeah, yeah. I believe double check cool. me on that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's what I read. Most decorated bobsledder in history, um, at least for females. I'm pretty sure for both men and women. Um, so she's just the longevity that she's had in the sport, being able to be on the podium and all these Olympics. It's just been incredible. And again, like it, yes, the hardware is great. Getting to see her on the stand was incredible, but. More importantly, the things that people say about her, the things that she does with her platform is nothing short of inspiring. So Alana Myers-Taylor, everything about her was a top moment for me. (laughs) Yeah, no, and and I'm glad you brought her up because I neglected to put her on my list and she deserved to be on there. So I'm I'm glad (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad that you remembered to talk about her and and kind of as a little asterisk to that, one of my bonus uh (laughs) <laughs> items on my list was also just about the sliding events in general. Uh, so speaking of the gold and silver that were won in women's mono bob, that was kind of the the bright exception to what was German dominance in yeah. the sliding events. You know, they won nine out of 10 golds. So, um, you know, not to be, we don't want to be too Team USA centric here, although our bias is very clear and obvious. So I think it's worth noting the German team and just how, I don't know, they were amazing to watch. Uh, I love Mm -hmm. watching the sliding events, even though it's not Team USA's strongest area of sports. I always love watching them and I was amazed by their athleticism and their ability. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for me, that was definitely a highlight as well as just getting to watch Team Germany (laughs) do their thing. Yeah, they're doing something right. And didn't they also get a podium sweep on the men's side? They went one, two, and three, Mm -hmm. Um, which, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're they're dominant. And it, it, yeah, it was incredible. I I feel like I keep saying incredible. Take that out. (laughs) Yeah. And so kind of um, bouncing off of that, um, I also wanted to mention one of my standouts was also that uh, Norway set a record of 16 gold medals at a single Winter Games. That is the that's the new record for the amount of gold medals won by a nation at a Winter Games. And Norway always does amazing, of course. <laughs> they And a lot of that's because of the skiing events. They've been doing it for 4,000 years. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that they set that record, and I didn't really hear a whole lot of people talking about that. So I wanted to make sure we put it on the record here that, Norway, you did an amazing job and set that new record of most golds won at a at a winter games. So so Sarah, what what's your next item? 
Oh goodness, let's see. Next item, I am going to say, let's go to cross country skiing. Um, yeah. There, there were a lot of great moments that happened with cross country skiing, but something that I thought was pretty cool is that we had an event where Finnish skier Evo Niskinson, he won his third Olympic gold medal. Um, he should be used to this right now. And, you know, yeah. he might be, but I'm sure I'm sure it's still exciting. But he is a champion. And in a, I mean, yeah, you you know his name. When you show up to compete against him, you know that he's going to be good. Well, right. Columbia sent a cross-country skier, and he finished about 25 minutes, I believe is what I read. Um, forgive me if I get that wrong. But he finished in last place. Uh, his name was Carlos Andre Quintana. And even though he was last place, we had our buddy from Finland, Nis Niskinson. He was waiting for him to greet him at the finish line. And I thought that was a wonderful example of sportsmanship is that even yeah. though he's this champion, even though he is a living legend already, um, has all these accolades to his name, he wanted to make sure to congratulate our friend from Colombia on crossing the finish line. And I thought that was great. There's so much of the Olympic spirit of being able to take part, like even though he knew he probably wasn't going to get a medal, um, but being there, taking part, crossing the finish line, and then being greeted by the Olympic champ to round out the event. I thought that was pretty special. Yeah, and especially that happening in cross-country skiing where you have every excuse, frankly, to go and get some rest as soon as you cross that finish line because it's an absolutely exhausting sport. It's not like... It's not like in the summer games when the sprinters are able to congratulate each other after their race, which is also exhausting. But there's a huge difference between being able to shake hands and high five after a 200 meter dash versus, you know, 1500 meters, 2000 meters or whatever for cross country skiing. So I agree. The fact that he hung around to make sure that he could recognize his fellow athletes for their accomplishment as well is you're absolutely right. It's the Olympic spirit in its purest form for sure. Well, I think while we're talking about Finland, this isn't going to take up a lot of time. So I think I just have to give a shout out to Finland winning gold in men's hockey and what an accomplishment that is because uh, they've really only won a few medals in, in their history in the winter games uh, as far as hockey is concerned uh, and this was the only gold that they've won so far and it was it was just fun to see them get that recognition for their team in a sport that tends to be dominated by the same names over and over again and i think uh, i think while i'm on that note this actually isn't really on my list but it's just a funny story so when the U.S. was still in contention during tournament play and they beat Canada, which was the first time the U.S. men's hockey team had beat Canada in 12 years. I mentioned that. And my oldest son, when he heard that, he said, "Ooh, history burn. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what's funny about that is we don't use that expression around here. We don't say, "Ooh, burn at all. I don't even think he fully realized what he was saying, but it was so perfect in the moment that my wife and I just died, you know, <laughs> because it was That's so funny. Amazing. Um, I got to add that to my vocabulary. Yeah. History burn. So that was, yeah, it was a great moment uh, in our household, at least. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, so this is one that is definitely not positive, and it's something that mm -hmm. I, you know, there's so many articles out about it. Everyone has strong opinions, and I get that rightfully so. So we don't need to get into all the nitty gritty of it, but mm -hmm. I do think that everything that happened with figure skating, specifically in the women's event and the team event, really, um, yeah. I think that I think it's important to talk about and to acknowledge. Um, I I don't know if we're gonna see things change or not but i really hope that um the situation with camila valieva and coming off the ice and the women's figure skating free skate being ridiculed after everything that she went through and her coach just ripping her apart um yeah seeing that on display seeing the uncomfortable situation where you have the gold medalist who just kind of looked awkward sitting there and then yeah sherbakova just looked lost yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you had the silver medalist, Trusova, who is just mm -hmm. melting down. And there was just so much there that, 
you could look at that and you could compare it to one of the U.S. figure skaters, Alyssa Liu, who just was so happy to be there. She she wasn't going to end yeah. up on the medal stand, but she was just so happy. And to be able to see that stark contrast of being there because you love it and it's exciting for you as a 16 year old compared to these 15 and 17 year olds from the Russian Olympic committee. It was just so mm -hmm. sad. And, and though it was painful to watch, um, I think it stopped a lot of people in their tracks. I think it got a lot of people who haven't been paying attention to the Olympics to pay attention to just kind of how, um, how severe things are over there. Um, with just the system. And then of course you have the doping where <laughs> it's the Russian Olympic committee yeah. because Russia can't stop being dopers. And this 15 year old yeah. had a failed drug test. And so she shouldn't have even been skating to begin with, but you know, I don't put the blame on her. I want to be clear about that. I, I think that she is a victim of a terrible yeah. system, um, but it was just so hard to watch. So even though it was hard to watch, I feel like it was important. I've had people that have asked me like neighbors and such, just asking me what happened. Should I watch it? Do I want to watch it? And I keep telling <laughs> if people who have asked me if they should watch it, that it's difficult, but that it's important. And, and I hope that it becomes very historical in the sense of it being something that affects some change, either with the IOC being tougher on Russia or, you know, Russian coaches having an overhaul and how they coach, but mm -hmm. I'm not holding my breath for that one. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly what all the answers are, but hopefully there's some stronger discipline than what we've seen before. Yeah, I mean, it. unfortunately, this is going to be one of those things that these games are remembered for. It's going to be something mm -hmm. people talk about for years, you know, because that's what scandals, <laughs> scandals just attract that kind of attention. And, you know, and I don't even like calling this necessarily a scandal. I, I've been calling it the figure skating saga. And, you know, full disclosure, I did not watch the full uh, competition for women's figure skating because it didn't work with my schedule and I heard about all this happening and there was a part of me that was just like Ugh, do I really want to watch this do I and I ended up seeing it anyway because I tuned in at a time they were doing a replay and I saw the whole this whole end <laughs> of the event play out and I couldn't take my eyes off of it but, you know, I think to to be a little positive with it, uh, because there were a lot of hard things to see in that whole meltdown, I think a couple things we have to mention that we would want people to remember is, first off, regardless of the doping situation, the coaching situation, the meltdown, this was the first time that we saw women complete quads at an Olympic Games. And that's still worth noting, because mm -hmm. that's incredibly difficult. And again, not validating what the training may have looked like for them to be able to accomplish that and just acknowledge that what they did on the ice was amazing. And it's, mm -hmm. it's worth remembering their performances for the performances themselves, regardless of the meltdowns that occurred afterwards. Yeah, I, ag I agree with that. And I think it's also worth shouting out Japan's Kaori Sakamoto, who... Oh, uh, Yes. Yes, was the one bright spot of sunshine in that meltdown because, you know, everyone came into these games assuming that there was going to be a Russian sweep. And so to see her happiness and joy to get the bronze and to see her hard work acknowledged helped make this situation a bit more bearable. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so very, ha I, very I happy for her. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was right. great. Um one more thing to add to that, though, yeah. just because I mentioned it um, with the team event. So anyone who doesn't know that might be listening to this, um, the team event that took place before the women's free skate, Camila mm -hmm. Valieva, the girl that had the failed drug test, um, she was part of the team event. She skated. Long story short, no medals were awarded. And this is the whole reason that it's not just one athlete one delegation it's everyone is punished when you have doping at the olympics because we yeah. know that the u.s at least got silver they might get bumped up to gold but they got yeah. silver and they were thrilled about that um yeah. <laughs> they, they knew they knew that that was a big deal and then you had japan who got bronze and whenever you're seeing these homecoming videos of athletes leaning back in their countries and they have medals around their neck, it's so sad that people who know that they're a medalist, even if they don't know what color it is, it's so sad that they don't get that moment to come home and show off their medal. Um, and so or, or my hear heart, their anthem. 
you know, see their flag. Like that's a big part of that moment. (laughs) Absolutely. So, um, so my heart breaks for that. And, and I hope that, you know, again, I'm not going to pretend that I know what the perfect solution is in all this. I, I would think that maybe you could have at least given the athletes their silver and bronze medals because they know they at least got that until you do a swap or something. But, um, it makes, it makes me so sad that these athletes are going to get their medals in a box yeah. in the mail at some point. And it could be months, it could yeah. be years. And that's just not fair to them. Could they miss sponsorship opportunities? Could they miss, um, you know, just these special moments? Like they deserve that. Um, well, and, they deserve to celebrate like, it together because it is a too. team event. They, they, they deserve that chance to get to pat each other on the back and say, hey, it was fun to get to compete with you as a teammate because they don't live in the same areas together. Some of them may right. never be in the same room ever again in their life, and they don't get that moment to congratulate their teammates, which is really sad. Yeah, it is sad. So yeah, just a note on that. I don't think it's right, um, and yeah. it just stinks. It just stinks. So hopefully in the future, there'll be a better protocol. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Uh, you know, I, ideally, people just don't dope, right? right. <laughs> and then we right. don't have to deal with this. Um, but, you know, I know that's idealistic of me to think, but there it is. I mean, that's the solution is for people to to follow the rules and do things the right way. And then you don't cause complications for everyone else. While we're on the topic of figure skating, I'm going to go ahead and jump to something on my list, which is Nathan Chen winning gold. Uh, in the men's event, because there's a couple of reasons I want to highlight him. Um, one of those is the fact that, again, we're showing our bias here, but the men's figure skating has not exactly historically been a strong point for Team USA. Usually, we used to be a powerhouse in the women's event, and that used to be where all of the attention was. And every now and then we would have, you know, a man who would maybe get bronze or something like that, but we've never it's been a long time since we've had a real powerhouse like Nathan Chen. So it it was fun to see him just go out there and have, have fun and just enjoy his skates and just dominate the way he did. And then the second reason I think it's important to acknowledge him is just the fact that representation matters and being a dad to an Asian child. It was important for me that my son see a strong Asian man on the TV winning gold in figure skating. So I I have to throw that out there before we move past figure skating that for me, that was one of the highlights of the game was seeing Nathan Chen do his thing and just, you know, show a ton of class, show a ton of sportsmanship and just, you know, really exemplify the excellence of his discipline. Absolutely. We're we're big Nathan Chen Chen fans in our house because Nathan Chen just seems like a really cool guy. We, we just really like him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's one thing that we kept saying is just his basketball (laughs) fandom and everything. He's just really cool. So props (laughs) to you, Nathan Chen. We all love you. Um, okay. So next up, this is incredibly biased of me and I am well aware of that. And I'm sure that my bias (laughs) to this will continue to um, be on display as we keep going on our podcast, Odyssey. But um, I was thrilled to see that John Schuster was one of our flag bearers. I was also thrilled for Alana Myers Taylor to be voted. And then of course she couldn't do it. So Brittany Bo stepped in, thought she was great too. Great choice. Right. Um, But I do want to say on the record that because I'm petty and I own that, Um, I predicted (laughs) that Schuster and Alana Myers Taylor would be our flag bearers. And my husband doubted me. And so I just need people to know that I was right (laughs) and he was wrong. Um, And I was not surprised, but I was thrilled about Schuster because it was his fifth Olympics. And something about Schuster is that he has said this in interviews. He has said it when I've chatted with him and he just loves the Olympics. He loves being an Olympian. He loves representing the United States and before he won the gold in 2018 in Pyeongchang, he would say, I just really, really want to see the American flag on top at the Olympics. I just want to hear my anthem at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. He's just so proud to be an American. And, and, you know, I I know that that might sound really ethnocentric. He's a very kind, humble guy. You know, he's not (laughs) one of these crazy, like super, it's all about me that, you know, like he loves the international community. Um, So don't get me wrong on that. 
But knowing how much pride he takes in being an Olympian, representing the United States and representing his family, he's such a proud dad, a proud husband. Um, it, it, that was just such a special moment for me to see. And um, you could tell how much it meant to him and Brittany Bow, of course. Um, and then Alana when she got to do yeah. that closing ceremony. Um, so I don't want to neglect them. But I was just super excited based on knowing his story, knowing things that he has said. Um, I know it would mean the world to so many athletes. So I'm not going to pretend that, you know, he's the only person that this means a lot to. Um, but But it was right. just really cool. Yeah. And while we're on the topic of curling, so this was really the first winter games that my son could really engage with because uh, the last time around he was only four years old. And and really, I can't remember why, but we did not get to watch a ton of the Pyeongchang games. Uh, we caught it when we could, but our schedules were just crazy that year and we just did not get to watch a lot. So he got really into curling <laughs> watching it this year. And and I, I have to share this moment because it wasn't on my list, but it was hilarious. We were watching the mixed doubles match between Australia and Great Britain. So because we didn't have the the fans there creating noise and because they were mic'd up and on the TV, you could actually hear them talking to each other and strategizing. He was sitting there watching. And of course, you've got the Australian team with their accents. You've got the Great Britain team there with their accents, which they were Scottish, of course, because curling. Mm -hmm. And at one point, my son looks over at me and he goes, Dad, are they speaking English? <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah, son, they they are speaking English. They just have very different accents than we do. <laughs> and it was it was just such a it was such a golden moment um, in our household when he asked that question. That is absolutely incredible. Yes, it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> and then also while we're kind of on the topic of the opening ceremony, too, this was one of my bonus things, but I'm going to throw it in there because it fits in. So, you know, I didn't really have any major highlights from the opening ceremony, but I do want to mention really quickly the cauldron or rather what I've been dubbing the smaldron. The small yeah, what I, I almost just said, uh, what cauldron? I didn't see a cauldron. Yeah. Um, now, I liked the snowflake concept. I loved all the country snowflakes yes. coming together. And that, that was that was great. And then that moment was just wah, wah, wah. Um, here's the deal. I'm all about being green. I am all about us doing a better job as as an entire world of creating sustainable solutions like absolutely all about that this was one of those times i couldn't get behind like there there's other ways we can do it <laughs> so yeah the the small trend was not a highlight in a good way but it was a highlight yeah that was something i just remember when it was I'm not going to say lit, but they, they basically <laughs> placed the torch <laughs> into the middle of all these little snowflakes. And I kept thinking it was going to go somewhere. And then it didn't. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's it. And I'm with you. I love the snowflake concept. The snowflake concept was so great. Having all these countries come in with their snowflakes. And then, you know, it was like a big puzzle. That was, that was great. I'm so supportive of that. Um, but that was not a cauldron. It just wasn't. <laughs> like I said, it's the smaldron. So that's what I'm going to yes. call it from here on out when we talk about the 2022 games. And uh, but anyway, I had to throw it in there because it, it was it was memorable, even if not in the best way. So, yep, I agree. Speaking of things that are memorable, but maybe not in the best way, uh, we'll uh, throw in a, another little hard thing in here before we head into more positive space. But we have to talk about the diplomatic boycott. Uh, yeah. over the, you know, Uyghur human rights abuses in China. And, you know, this is a complicated thing because, you know, first off, no country is perfect, right? This is a conversation we have in our household all the time that uh, that every country makes mistakes. Every country, if you look at our history, uh, U.S. included. So, again, mm -hmm. yes, we're U.S., but we're, we're not looking at our country with rose-colored glasses. Uh, our country has made some really dark and terrible mistakes <laughs> and our leaders mm -hmm. might not admit that, but we're here to admit it. Um, yeah. So it, it's always complicated to point the finger at other 
countries. But at the same time, we do have to point the finger when we see something wrong happening and we can't turn a blind eye to that. So, you know, I think the diplomatic boycott was, um, you know, it was a good middle ground move to draw attention to the human rights abuse taking place without punishing the athletes like what happened for the Moscow games in 1980. But it'll be always something that sticks out about these games and that I think people will remember for a long time. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, I'm with you. I was fully supportive of the diplomatic boycott um, in the sense that the athletes were still getting to go. It's not their fault. Um, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, your, your lead into that was really good, that it's complicated. Um, mm-hmm. we recognize that no country is perfect. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I don't know if you'll want to cut this out or not, but just, it, it's also a really interesting time right now being in between the Olympics and Paralympics, because the date that we're recording this segment of the podcast, um, well, I guess I was just going to say, there's a lot going on with the Ukraine and today has been a really heavy day yeah. for the world. And, yes. um, and recognizing that it's just, it's an, it's a weird, very weird time to try to you know, it's just, it's a very heavy and weird time. And we don't know all the, all the solutions and all the answers. Um, but it's just a very important time to have the Olympics in China. Um, very interesting, I guess. Yeah. I don't really know the right words for it. And and I think one thing I want to throw out there too, that I haven't heard other people talk about is there's been a lot of conversation about should the winter games have been taken away from China over this, but here's the deal. This issue would not be getting the attention that it has gotten if the Olympics had not been in China. And it because Mm -hmm. my brother sent me an article about this situation with the Uyghur people probably about four years ago. He found it on some side. I mean, and it wasn't even a major news site. It wasn't CNN. You know, it wasn't any of these major outlets. He found this story and he sent it to me years ago and said, hey, have you heard about this? And I did some digging into it and looking at it. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is really terrible. No, I haven't seen anyone talking about this situation. And I didn't hear anyone else talking about this situation until about a year ago. So... You know, again, it's it's been going on for a long time and people didn't pay attention until the Olympics were getting closer and and it brought it to light. And so I hope in some way that that by exposing it and by raising that issue on a larger scale, it gets addressed. I hope. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. Um, It probably wasn't four years ago for me, but I feel like it's been quite a while that I mm-hmm. was at least vaguely familiar with everything going on. Well, not everything. I'm not going to pretend I know everything, but, um, you know, with the Uyghurs and knowing a lot of the things that are going on and the persecution and the camps and whatnot. But, um, but I, you know, like you said, this has brought a lot of attention is I had a lot of people that were coming out of the woodworks and wanting to stir up stuff and saying both on my social media feeds and, um, and even face-to-face conversations saying like, well, I can't believe you're going to watch the Olympics because you're supporting communism or you're supporting China and all this. And I just kind of formed this right. routine response that was, well, I am so happy that you're paying attention to human rights violations in China. Please keep that energy up after the Olympics. And I'm also so happy that you're paying attention to Olympic athletes that deserve to get to compete. Um, please keep that energy up too. <laughs> and um, and that was just kind of like yeah. my, my <laughs> neutral response of, yeah, this is great that you're paying attention. I don't support what China's doing. Um, And the other thing is that, you know, I would also kind of chime in there with the IOC awarded China the games years ago. So when the IOC awards the Olympics to places like this, where there's some shady stuff going on, let's hope that people are paying attention uh, before they, the games actually happen. (laughs) Um, and, and, and I don't, I don't want us to become a political think show or anything like that, but I I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of politicians decided to speak out when it's a midterm year. Um, I wish that a lot of these politicians that were in office for the past 30 years would have said something, you know, when they had a chance, like, eight years ago. Right. Um, so, so, you know, I, right. again, I'm not trying to become a political pundit here, um, but it's just interesting. There, there's a lot going on, at least in the United States, people with opinions, sometimes there's different motives for having opinions, but no matter what, at the end of the day, it makes me, um, it, it, it brings me hope 
that people are paying attention to world events, that they're paying attention to China and human rights mm-hmm. abuses, that people will be more vocal and be more involved in, um, not just hide under a rock with it. And, and not just with China, but anywhere that the Olympics may end up. Yeah, no, absolutely. Heading into a more positive space now. Uh, yeah. I'm going to throw a couple <laughs> of my things together um, just for time's sake, but also because they're, they're small things that don't take a lot of time to talk about. But uh, but yeah, let's celebrate a couple of things. Let's celebrate the fact that this was the Winter Olympic debut of both Haiti and Saudi Arabia. This was the first time they've competed in the Winter Olympics. And I think that's really cool because those are not wintry countries, obviously. So it was fun that they had a presence here at the games and is, you know, the more countries that get involved in the winter Olympics, it just continues that spirit of unity that the games are based on to begin with. So I love seeing these new countries join in, uh, anytime, uh, that they, I don't care who they are, or where they're from. It's just fun to have more countries represented there at the games. So, uh, I have yes. to throw that in there. And then on that note, kind of piggybacking, um, talk a little bit about New Zealand having their best Winter Olympic showing ever. They won three medals, two of which were gold, and that's out of only sending 15 athletes. Think about that for a second. Only 15 athletes, and they came away with three medals. You know, we get spoiled here in the States by how many medals we bring home, especially from the summer games. Um, but this is a huge deal for them to to be able to accomplish that. So I, I think it's worth giving a shout out to New Zealand for their incredible team performance that they had this year. Yes. And that they did the haka dance in the snow. We love a haka. <laughs> We do love a haka dance. Uh, yeah, big fan of it. But um, but yeah, anyway, so moving on, uh, what's next on your list? I feel like I've done several things back to back. Oh, goodness. Um, next on my list that was very positive was, um, I'm going to say I really enjoyed, it, it, this is me going to uh, put a few together kind of quickly, but um, I really sure. enjoyed the mixed team events. We got mixed mm-hmm. luge, like a relay. Um, we had mixed alpine skiing. Um, which that was a really, really exciting event. Um, I've never seen a skiing event seem to move on so fast. Um, I would highly recommend going back and watching the team event. If you've not, um, there's two men, two women that were representing each country going against each other. And basically like, you've got to win your round, move on. And not a ton of rest time in between. Um, But it was was fun to watch. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was a ton of fun to watch. I loved it. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, here's my bias coming out, but it was really great to see the U.S. finish fourth because apparently uh, the World Cup events where they do this type of racing, we're usually not in the conversation for a medal at all. And so to a lot of people, seeing us finish off the podium is not great, but they were thrilled with the fourth place result because they're saying, no, like we're, we're in the mix here. Um, So that's really that's really exciting that the athletes could look at it from that perspective. Um. Mixed yeah. aerials was great, but um, speaking of mixed team events, there was a super exciting event, which was the mixed <laughs> snowboard cross. Oh my goodness, it yeah. was exciting! I mean, first of all, you had Lindsay Jacob Ellis, which, if you know her story, the fact yeah. that she got individual gold um, 16 years yeah. after getting silver that was a phenomenal, yeah. But then she was on the mixed team with Nick Baumgartner. And he kind of had some Olympic heartbreak. He was very open with it in an interview. Yeah. He knew he still had a shot. And that a couple of days later, he was going to get another chance at a medal. He's 40 years old. And people are just referring to this as like the 80s babies race because <laughs> she's 36, <laughs> he's 40. And they showed yeah. that it doesn't matter how old you are. You can get out there and still do your stuff. You know, age is just a number. Um, but... Yeah, they were able to pull it together and pull out a victory and get the gold. And there's a really cool video that kind of went viral here in the U.S. of Lindsay was doing the final run for the gold medal. Right. And Nick is on the sidelines cheering her on. And um, two of the snowboarders went down. They get back up and finish the race and all that. So, like, they were fine. But um, for Lindsay, it was really, really tight. Um, like you knew towards the end, she was at least getting a medal, but you didn't know what color. And on the last little jump, um, she grabbed her snowboard, which I thought was amazing. Her story is that 2002, she, or no, 2006, no, 
2006. Yes, 2006. Yeah. She grabs her she grabs her snowboard. Um, she's about to win gold, grabs her snowboard just because she was caught up in the moment, causes her to stumble, she gets silver. She never lived it down in the American media. People were really mean to her. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I thought it was very <laughs> um, I don't want to use the word badass on the podcast. Um, I, <laughs> That's, I mean, I, I okay. don't mind. <laughs> okay. Well then I, I don't know of another word. I thought it was very badass of her to <laughs> grab her board <laughs> yeah. um, and, and say, I'm over this and everyone else should be too. And guess what? I'm about to get my second gold medal at these Olympics, but watching Nick cheer her on, on the sidelines. Um, she, he, he was just so excited and it was great because his fellow competitors were coming around him. And even though, you know, they wanted a gold too, I have no doubt. Everyone yeah. tries to win, but they were also right. so excited for him um, and watching the emotions on his face. I mean, he was just like borderline in tears being like, come on, Lindsay, come on, girl, you got this, here's your experience. <laughs> um, so it, it was a very feel-good moment. And again, just proving that who says that you're done being an Olympian by the time that you're 25? Oh, you're absolutely right. It was one of the, I mean, Team USA aside, it was just a great race to watch. It mm -hmm. was exciting. It just, I mean, it gave you all the feels. And I was, yes, I was so happy for Nick in that moment. Um, after the heartbreak he had experienced just a couple of days before. And, you know, and frankly, just feeling like, when he said in that interview, I'm running out of chances. And then it was like, buddy, you're about to get your chance. And and mm -hmm. you nailed it. You know, like, especially watching his half of that race is just so fun. Because um, he just went out with confidence. And he didn't let his disappointment from a few days ago. I mean, psychology is such a big part of sports. And he didn't let that disappointment hold him back. He went out there and did what he needed to do. And so I don't care what country you're from, but being able to leave that behind and being able to go out and just have fun and do your best is, is always rewarding to watch. So yeah, that was definitely a highlight for me as well. And while we're on the topic of snowboarding, I've got a couple others to throw in there. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too long, uh, but Chloe Kim, mm -hmm. I, I always have to give her a shout out because I just love her. Um, her just spirit, her joy. She just loves her sport so much. And she became the first, uh, you know, first woman snowboarder to win back to back gold in the event. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was definitely a highlight. Uh, yeah, love watching her. She's fantastic. Uh, and then slope style snowboarding, what, what I've dubbed the women's slope style snowboarding love fest. I yes. just, yes, the end of that event before. They knew who was getting what color medal. Just seeing that group of young women celebrate each other because only they understand how difficult their sport is. And just seeing how much camaraderie there is there, the sportsmanship, how much they love each other as people, regardless of the flag that they have on their uniform. That was hands down one of my favorite moments of these games is just watching them tackle each other and, yeah. and celebrate excellence in their sport it was just so fun. Yeah, I agree. I think I had that in my on my list, too. Um, I, yeah, mm -hmm. it was it's interesting because I don't know if this is the same for you and your circle of friends, but anytime something major happens with the Olympics, my phone starts blowing up with friends who are just kind of <laughs> casually watching it. And so that when that happened, my phone, I got several texts from people being like, did you see this? I can't believe that they're all hugging each other. And um, so it's definitely <laughs> one of those things that makes an impact on people. Yeah. Um, you know, like you said, no matter the metal color, it that again, like we talked about with um, cross country skiing, it's the Olympic spirit on display. Absolutely. Um, and before we leave snowboarding uh, behind, of course, uh, we have to talk about Sean White's farewell. And, you know, he's always a class act. Obviously, he would have loved to have meddled. He said as much in his in his interview. Um, as you already said, everyone goes to the Olympics wanting to win a medal. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. That That's right. a good thing. Um, and so, you know, I know he was disappointed coming in fourth. And I know people who were disappointed about him coming in fourth and just missing that podium at his last Olympics. But he has done so much for this sport. And I think you have this on your list. But, you know, seeing Japan take gold in it and the fact that Sean White was famous in Japan 
before he was famous here because snowboarding mm -hmm. is so popular there and he became an icon there. And so many people in that country have looked up to him for years and modeled their style after him. You know, the impact he has made on the sport is something that will, you know, it's his legacy. It will outlive him um, in so many ways. So, you know, uh, it was it was fun getting to just watch him compete one more time. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I remember him saying that kind of stuck with me is he said that he could look around and see that these younger guys were doing things that he knows he's not capable of doing at this point. And mm -hmm. he's like, I finally feel like I can step away. And, and I thought that mm -hmm. was just really telling of where his heart is. Um, like you said, he went out with class and nothing but respect for him. Um, there's, there's part of me that was like, is he going to pull Michael Phelps? Is he going to come back in four years? I don't think he is. I think he is done. But um, I mean, he yeah. certainly has paid his dues to the sport. I think we'll, we'll be hearing his voice. Yes, yes, yeah. that's what I'm saying. We'll hear him as a commentator. Because, um, I mean, yeah. who who better? So I'm excited to see what the future holds for him. And I did have it on my list that that I had kind of the event on my list because it was so exciting. And, you know, you can't ignore Sean White. Um, but Hiramo Ayumu winning gold for Japan. Um, his tricks were just incredible. Absolutely he incredible. And was amazing yeah yeah i i'm not a snowboard expert oh my but... gosh <laughs> yeah he was yeah. in a league of his own yeah i couldn't believe what i was saying. i was like this has to be special effects how are they able to get that far up in the air it was yes he and, and all the other japanese snowboarders too were just amazing to mm -hmm. watch they were mm -hmm. you know super solid team just really amazing all right we're kind of uh yeah we probably kind of need to wind this part of it down here pretty soon. So, but there are a few more things we need to talk about. This one's going to be really fast. Um, so Sarah, you might be surprised that I included this on my list because we've talked about how I don't care about the mascots as much as you do, but I have to, <laughs> I have to put Bing Dwindwin on my list. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. Now part of that's a personal bias Giant pandas are my favorite animal in the world, and they have been since I was a little kid. That's never changed for me. So, you know, part of it, I know, is just nostalgia for me, just loving pandas. But it was fun to see a mascot that was involved as he was. You would see him pop up in all kinds of different places and doing different things. And you don't always see that with the mascots. So uh, I think he's worth making the list this time around. <laughs> I'm so, I am so happy you put him on the list. What a, what a nice surprise. He was adorable. Um, there was one night I went through Twitter yeah. just searching Bing Dwin Dwin videos that people have posted. And yeah, people were spending hours in line trying to get Bing Dwin Dwin, um, like a little stuffed animal to bring home. And a couple of my friends that are there working with the media, especially this guy Price, like they got him. And I was so happy for him. Like, I don't know if I was more happy for some of my favorites that were having these great Olympic moments as athletes, or if I was happier for my friends in the press that were able to find Bing Dwin Dwin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. and it was a big deal. And then you had athletes that were freaking out over like getting selfies with Bing Dwin Dwin. And, um, so yeah. with an Olympics that, you know, there was COVID and all these negative things associated with it, Bing Dwin Dwin was such a bright spot. Again, I usually don't really care that much about the mascots. I mean, they're cute or whatever. And sure, why not? It's good marketing. But uh, I don't know. He, he stood out for me. So I, I had to give him a shout out. And then... I know we both have her on on both of our lists, so let's go ahead and talk about Erin Jackson. <laughs> ah, I mean, that's it. That's the tweet, Erin Jackson. <laughs> she was so fun to watch, so fun to watch. Um, and, you know, we got to watch her race, the final, I should say. We got to watch that one live, and I was just so happy for her, so excited. And of course, it's just great to see just more representation in a sport that has been, let's face it, predominantly white, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. in terms of the U.S. And, you know, especially, yes, she has a history with, um, you know, she she did uh, roller skating, you know, for a long time. But the fact that she didn't put on ice skates until 2016 Mm -hmm. And now is the reigning world champion and Olympic champion. I mean, just amazing performance. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I have nothing to add other than 
it was beautiful. No, yeah. We got to we got to watch it live as well and there was a lot of screaming in our house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah, we this list would not be complete without um talking about her. And then um okay, do you have anything else left? I have one thing left on my list. Um, I think that we might have the same thing left, but I want to double check before we move on. Yeah, um I think okay, I think I know which the last thing is that you're talking about. I did want to say it was super interesting to watch Michaela Schifrin have her struggles in yeah, the yeah. spotlight. No, let's yeah, let's talk and, about Michaela Schifrin. That's not my last thing. So Michaela Schifrin, I thought it was super fascinating. So my background is sociology, so I tend to overanalyze things and try to come up with cause and effect, nature versus nurture, blah, blah, blah. Um, I thought it was interesting right. to watch the tone of you know, I know she got some hate. Because people are rude and hateful. Yeah. But it seemed like the tone with her was mostly positive and one full of support. And I thought that was really interesting coming off of last summer with the Tokyo Olympics. You have Simone Biles and you have these athletes who not just at the Olympic level, but on world championships level and um, different international meets and competitions and whatnot, that these women they are good. They, they are the greatest at what they do with or without the Olympic medals. Mm -hmm. Like their world championships results have already spoken for themselves and nothing is going to take away that Michaela Schifrin is one of the greatest, if not the greatest Alpine skier that our generation will ever see. Um, you know, I, I know some people will make different arguments right. on that, but regardless, she's at, she's at the top. She is definitely at the top, um, of the conversation and to watch her deal with the setbacks that she's had and to watch her deal with the media and just be so open and honest and transparent. I think, I think the world learned a lot of lessons from Simone Biles last summer. And I think that we saw some of those lessons come to play with the way that she was treated. It, it, and, you know, again, I know that she was reposting some of the comments she got that were not kind, not supportive, but I think overall yeah. I saw a lot of positivity coming her way and just a lot of empathy of being in the situation, you know, NBC kept talking about how she had just lost her father a couple of years ago, and he was a major part of her skiing and right. how she, you know, the first race or two, she couldn't figure out why, why am I not finishing? What's going on here? And it was making her question stuff. And so just the fact that she didn't quit in the middle of that, like for me, I'd be like, I'm out, I'm not doing this, but she persevered and competed in all the events that she planned to do. And that takes a lot yeah. of guts and I respect the heck out of her for it. Um, and, and I, I just think that watching this happen to athletes like Simone, like Michaela, um, that seem almost untouchable mm -hmm. and seeing that human side of them. I, I just think it's fascinating. And I think it, I think it's good. I think it's good for our culture, good for our society. Um, to be able to see that even these amazing athletes are humans too. And I hate it for them. I hate it for them because I know yeah. it's painful for them. Um, but I appreciate the lessons that we can all learn from that. Yeah. You know, my wife and I were talking about how our media, and I'm, I'm talking mostly about the U.S. here, obviously, we put so much pressure and expectation on these athletes and going back to Simone Biles in particular, um, you know, going into the Tokyo Games, you would hear people talk about her as if it was just guaranteed she was going to win the gold in the all around, mm -hmm. right? That it was mm -hmm. already a foregone conclusion. And those of us who are in the gymnastics community and go to gym meets all the time know that there is no foregone conclusion when it comes to any sport, but especially something like gymnastics, um, you know, it only takes you having one bad day mm -hmm. or an injury uh, to be out of the picture. And so, yeah, I, I applauded Simone Biles for her decision not to compete and to pull herself out because it mm -hmm. was the best thing for the team. And it was the best thing for not just her mental health, but her physical health, too. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. she could have gotten really badly hurt. And she, it, it's not worth a piece of metal. I'm sorry. It's not. You it know, is absolutely uh, not. Which, yeah, which, by the way, congratulations, Simone. She yeah, just got engaged. she's engaged. Um, <laughs> yeah. A anyway, and so bringing that back to Michaela Schifrin, she had those same expectations on her. These foregone conclusions that she's going to come home with all these gold medals. And that's not a fair thing to put on someone. It's just mm -hmm. not. And, uh, you know, Nathan Chen 
going back to him for a second, you know, he said in an interview that he wasn't even turning on his phone because he just he needed to stay focused and he couldn't let that pressure of the expectation derail him from what he knew he needed to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so good for him. (laughs) Um, But it's hard because a lot of these athletes, their sponsorships are dependent on them posting. And so it becomes this really nasty, ugly catch 22 where for their career, they need to be engaged in social media. But then being engaged in social media can also cause this negativity to get piled on them. Yeah. So I... Yeah, I applaud her for not giving up, for persevering, and for dealing with the hate. I'm glad that she did seem to get a lot of support, too. But but we both know that sometimes the worst critic can be yourself. Yeah. And, and so for her to fight back against probably her own negative thoughts that she was experiencing and the, the villain inside of her own head, being able to push that to the side says a lot for her character. Yeah, so I'm glad you included her on the list. <laughs> yeah. And just like one more thought on that of being her own self critic, like that was something that I feel like I've mm-hmm. heard Simone allude to. And, you know, anyone who is on the world stage of like, you're not saying anything I haven't already thought about myself. Um, but for Michaela, it was fascinating right. to watch her give these quick interviews just minutes after not finishing a race. And they're asking her questions and she's just kind of sitting there like, yeah, this really sucks. I don't know. I don't have answers for you. And just the authenticity right. of that. Um, I, I appreciate that she wasn't trying to sugarcoat it and just say, well, you know, I'll try better next time. Or in the combined event, um, apparent, I didn't see it for myself, but apparently she said something like, yeah, that was a good event for me. But before we go to this next one, um, I'm not holding my breath. I don't think I'm going to make it. And, you know, some people might attack her and say, um, you know, oh, she's thinking negative thoughts. That's why she didn't make it. But she was just like, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm going to try, but I may not finish and I may not finish and that's it. And (laughs) so just like her being able to own what she was thinking and feeling, um, that's hard to do. It's, it's really hard. So, um, I, I think she still has a pretty, pretty darn good career ahead of her. Um, I think, you know, I think she's got so many years left, yeah. but if she also decides to retire, then she's already made a huge mark on the sport and on our country. Right. So it's okay. Either way, Absolutely. we love her. We support her. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, let's finish off talking about Jesse Diggins because I know she was on both of our lists. And I mean, this was a huge deal, you know, for Team USA, at least, you know, uh, <laughs> people from other yeah. countries may not care, <laughs> but But yeah, it was um, just, I I don't know. I I don't even really completely have words for her accomplishment. That that's how I feel about it is I'm Mm -hmm. just not even sure how to talk about it because, you know, cross country skiing is essentially the winter equivalent of a marathon. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Except I would say worse (laughs) and more difficult. It it looks so hard. I, down here in Texas, I cannot fathom yeah. how hard cross country skiing is. It looks scary. I I just don't understand. Those athletes are astounding. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the weather was so bad that I, oh. I'm sure you saw this, but you know, even the men's event, which is supposed to be 50 kilometers, it was so bad that the officials actually decided to shorten the men's event to 30 kilometers instead. Because mm-hmm. they just said this is this is impossible and we're going to be putting too many people in danger if we have them do the 50 kilometer course. So that should say something. And then, of course, finding out, you know, in the days afterwards that she had food poisoning 30 hours before <laughs> the event. And mm-hmm. I mean, uh, like for her to get silver was just absolutely amazing. And I read an article yesterday where the author was was actually dogging on the Olympics for most of the article and essentially saying that they shouldn't even be a thing anymore, that they're too expensive. They're too much trouble. They don't accomplish the ideals of world peace anyway. You know, he was saying all these things of why we really shouldn't have the Olympics anymore. And then he said, but Jesse Diggins. (laughs) And he was making the point in the article that this is why we should still keep the Olympics is because of these moments that remind us of the strength that we human beings are capable of. 
when we have the focus and the determination to see our pursuit to the end. Mm -hmm. And that whether we're an athlete or not, we can take inspiration from that and apply it to our everyday lives. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was an interesting article, but I felt like, yeah, we had to end with her because it was at the very end of the games and it was an incredible accomplishment. Um, and it'll be something I think that gets remembered for a, for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And not to mention, she picked up a bronze medal as well earlier in the games. And oh, yeah. I think I, I think I read she yeah. did eight events. Like she was eligible for eight and she entered eight events. And I think, uh, please don't hate me if I get this wrong. I think I've read she had top six finishes in all of those eight races, mm-hmm. which I think is extremely rare or has never been done for an American before, um, except for maybe in 2018 when she did it in 2018. Um, So she is elevating the United States in cross-country skiing. And, you know, I would say that about any country that is having this one athlete who I think is elevating a sport. Yes, we focus a lot more on Team USA. We see them on our TV more. But I would also commend her if she was with a different country. Um, She has shown that Americans can show up and compete in a sport where historically we've not done exceptionally well. Um, So she just continues to break records. And whenever I saw her cross that finish line for the silver medal and then basically pass out, (laughs) um, apparently she does that. She does that a lot. She talks about how she just kind of blacks out for (laughs) half the race and then just tries to get to the end. And the mental fortitude that that takes, I mean, (laughs) I don't know. I kind of looked at my husband. I'm like, man, I don't work out enough because I never get to that point. He (laughs) reminded me I probably shouldn't try to get to that point. Um, Right. So I I hope she's got some some Olympics left in her because she's just fun to watch. I mean, she she was still able to jump, you Uh know, off of the podium. Uh, I mean, she got she got good air on that jump, getting her silver medal at the closing ceremony. So. Uh, she, I guess she was recovered well. But yeah, I know we said this was going to be like a, a mini episode, but look, we, we basically just recorded a full episode anyway. So, but that's okay. We had a lot to say and, you know, we would have talked about this stuff anyway, so we might as well record it and, <laughs> and get it out into the world. But yeah, I think those were some of the standout things from Beijing 2022 um, Olympics that will stick with us for a while. And And hopefully, uh, if we forget some of these things, we can revisit the episode (laughs) later on and remember, oh, yeah, I remember that happening. That was so much fun Um, Mm -hmm. or not so much fun. (laughs) Some of these things were not fun. But I think you and I should take a water break before we record our next episode. (laughs) Let's do it. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content feature in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.